All right, guys, welcome <clears throat> to another episode of Market Trading. I'm your host, Tone Base. Uh, it might be raining in a bit, and uh, so I kept the show indoors today. Let's, uh, it's my last weekend here in the woods, and after that, it's back to, tra it's back to traveling. I got to go to Las Vegas to prep for Unconfiscatable. I'm going to be at Bit Black Boom, and, uh, and then uh, back to Panama. Might swing by Mexico on the way. I uh, have to try tequila in Mexico, I guess. Uh, speaking of tequila, uh, there is a link to the tequila spreadsheet in the video description. Uh, finally, finally making it public after like a year. All right, let's go to the charts. Uh, we're gonna, it's gonna be a short show, waiting for a lot more family members to arrive. And then I gotta start smoking some ribs. Takes about Minimum five hours. I like to do it closer to seven hours. So if I start smoking them at 11 a.m., uh, they'll be ready by 6 p.m., dinner time. All right, weekly chart. Let's look at the, uh, uh, you know what? We'll look at the oscillators next time because the week's going to roll over, so let's not bother. So the weekly chart is eh, nothing special. We have a continuation of the MRI to the downside. Yes, it's a green candle. Still have like 12 hours to go uh, in this candle. Not 12, sorry, a day and 12 hours to go in this candle. Uh, so like 36 hours to go. Uh, anything can still happen. This can easily close as a red candle. Uh, as you guys are aware, I was not on the bullish hype train of the rally. I lowered my bullish allocation. I stuck with it. Uh, a couple of trusted friends went long off the bounce i mean that's great they made money some of them are still in the long trade but they're waiting for more confirmation to the downside i had confirmation to the downside before the rally i'm sticking with my conviction to the downside and uh, these moving averages are going to roll over now if next candle is a down candle then you're going to have pretty much all three moving averages going down and that's not a good sign so i will stick with that 50 percent bullish allocation if we drop below 28 and a half, uh, I'm probably going to lower it to full cash because I am concerned. I am concerned that if Bitcoin falls below these two moving averages, if it falls below 27 and a half, then we got a problem. I think 27 needs to be support. Uh, right here, we came back and touched 25. If we start smelling 25 again, uh, I'm going to be very pessimistic. And uh, while I'm not going to take any short trades, it's too late for that. Um, I can easily see Bitcoin falling all the way down and making new lows below 15K. I think it's possible. Uh, but as long as it stays above 27,000, it's not possible. But if it falls below 27,000, it is possible to go down to, say, 11. So as long as we stay above 27, I will remain overall bullish. The moment we go below 27, Everything, like every price of Bitcoin goes back on the table, uh, all the way down to like 9,000. Possible. Anything can happen. But for now, I am lowering my bullish allocation, but staying bullish with a bullish conviction. If you are interested in trading, um, I have a couple of tools for you. There is a free learn trading section on phonebase.com. There is a slightly more advanced but paid section of on-demand educational videos. And finally, for the more advanced traders, there is the MRI indicator, which you get a five-hour educational video on and uh, uh, join our Telegram group. And it's a really good tool for trading. Those that want to meet in person and talk about trading and investing can come down to Dubai, November 5 to 10. Uh, that's where we will be hosting a bunch of traders, money managers, VCs, lots of high net worth individuals. Dubai is the perfect place for that. Uh, so come and join us there. Follow us on YouTube. Oh, the latest one is out. That's right. Uh, check out our latest video. This was our space from a few days ago talking about CPI. Just got published a few hours ago. Very, very relevant. Uh, CPI uh, came in exactly as we expected. So uh, check that out.
Right. And uh, we were joined by another professional trader. Uh, so on 2x speed, it's a very, very good listen. We put in some visuals as well. Uh, here are the CPI numbers. So all the things we discuss are right there. Unconfiscatable coming to Las Vegas, December 7 and 8. Oh, speaking of, guys, we are down to one carnivory ticket. We just sold two this week. So now we're down to one. So the last person to buy it at $300, otherwise the price goes up. To either 350 or 400, we're talking to a carnivory venue now, and it's not cheap. It is not cheap. Uh, I'm, uh, it's really hard because you have to pay double the price for the menu, right? Because if we're closing a restaurant and that restaurant can turn the table over, right? So it's not like, oh, you're paying $300 for a $100 meal. The restaurant charges us $300 for a $100 meal. That's the problem. Because the restaurant sees it as, well, if we get a reservation at six and then we use that table again at eight, and then maybe we get a latecomer coming in at 10, uh, that's uh, $300 that that table will make. But if we close the restaurant for 100 people, uh, then they're like, well, each person's going to have to pay triple because we think we're going to sell out every table three times. And uh, th th this dinner is going to go past $500. It's possible the dinner will be more expensive than the conference. So hurry up. If you want to join the speaker dinner, it's not going to be cheap. Your last chance to buy it at $300. One ticket left. After that, prices rise. Daily chart. Daily chart just doesn't look good. We're rolling over on the MRI. Yes, we had a green star candle. I said it the day of the scandal when we did a video. I'm not buying into this bullish trend. I need us to sustainably close above $30,500. We never got there. We never even touched $30,500. The 50 period moving average is rolling over. And this doesn't look good. So I will wait. The good news is, is that the next time the price of Bitcoin goes above 30000 I will be bullish. I no longer need to wait to 30 and a half. At this point, because we now established a double top, that lowers the area where I become bullish. Also, the 50-period moving average is going to be below 30,000 by the time we get back to 30,000. So that's the good news. The good news is the area where I become bullish is lower. The bad news is this is a pretty bearish, ugly-looking chart. And if we make it all the way down to 29,000, I'm going to be very, very bearish that the 128-day moving average is not going to hold. Uh, the short-term charge just has no volatility. Doesn't matter. GBTC, let's see where the discount closed. It's right at 25%. Uh, I think it's great that the discount has went up 100% in value while Bitcoin has been rising, but hasn't been rising all that much. Uh, Bitcoin doubled in price and GBTC discount shed half. It shed 25 uh, percent of the discount so if the bitcoin doubles in price again i think it's going to wipe out the entire gbtc discount or at least come close comes to within five percent maybe oil let's see where crude oil closed the week uh, crude oil closed the week as a doji candle a doji candle does have the likelihood of reversing but since the biden administration actually bought oil last week i'm very curious whoa what is that Oh, magnet shows up. Why does a magnet show? Right, anyway, I just wanted the circles to come in. Oh, that's why it does that. There we go. Because I had an arrow draw. Now, a doji candle usually means to sell some downside. A DMRI is still saying a little more upside. Let's look at the daily chart. Let's see if there's like a daily MRI top or something that's happening right here. On a daily scale, yeah, we're a couple of days away from an MRI top. And also the MACD is rolling over. This is interesting. 
it's possible oil might pull back. Uh, so let's see where this goes. The RSI is also uh, going down and it went into the overbought territory. So oil can roll over here. I don't think oil is going to go to new lows. Hey, Joe Kawasari, welcome. I don't believe oil is going to go to any new lows. Uh, oil can pull back down to the $75 zone. I'm still bullish on oil. And like I said, it's very, very interesting that the Biden administration purchased, purchased, not sold, but they purchased oil last week. It was, it was incredible. I, I, I can't make sense of it. I should I should have oh man, I should have linked those articles. They literally uh, wrote an article saying that they're not going to buy oil, but then they bought oil. And the week before, they said uh, that they were going to buy oil, but it was hard. Like it was just weird, just completely weird. I can't make sense of it. If someone can make sense of it, I would love to hear it. Uh, it just makes no sense to me. It says Joe, join. We'll take a look at some interest rates as well. I gotta I gotta link those articles over there. Uh, natural gas. So as I said, there was a beautiful long trade on natural gas. If you jumped on it, uh, you know, in the beginning of the Samurai buy candle, you would have done significantly better. Uh, jumping on it where I put the label, where I saw it, we're right at the break even line. I already said I would be pushing my uh, stop loss into break even or just below the moving average. Uh, we almost hit that line. So look how close we came to that line. Uh, that's a that was a weird down day. Natural gas didn't make sense to me either. I think natural gas is going higher. Natural gas trades very very leverage with huge leverage. Um, I I still think it's going higher. I think Europe is completely screwed, especially Germany. So we'll see where all that goes. They've been reading Sun True, yeah. <laughs> Gold. So I still remain bullish on gold, but if we break uh, 1925, uh, I'm going to be a lot less bullish. I still think gold can rally here. Uh, did you see Trump holds METH? I don't know what METH is. I know what Ethereum is. I don't know what METH is. And if some idiot advisor told Trump, uh, to hold a scam so that idiot advisor can profit from the scam that they have a bag in. Uh, I'm not surprised. S&P, I think the S&P is on a bit of a pullback here. I would love to see the S&P come down to the $4,400 area, bounce off the moving average, bounce off the trend line. I can even lower the trend line a smidge to match. It's still a valid trend line. Eh, a little less valid, but valid nonetheless. And uh, let's see if we pull into the $4,400 area. Uh, let's look at the daily S&P. Futures along with Bitcoin. Oh, the daily S&P futures are coming up on an MRI buy. That's going to happen on Monday. That would be very, very interesting. It's also holding the MRI support line. It's at an area of prior tops. It's in a perfect area to reverse from a daily scale. On a daily scale, very good opportunity for the S&P to reverse. Maybe we will not, will not even make it to 4,400. Let's see what happens on Monday. Now that the CPI numbers are out, let's see where the futures markets are anticipating whether Powell will or won't raise rates. <clears throat> so there's a 90% chance there will not be an interest, rate, an interest rate rise on, well, still a month away, right? September 20th, more than a month away. We still got about five weeks to go. Uh, so we still got a while to go. We're going to get another CPI print. We're going to get uh, another jobs report. So gold is already below 1915. It is? Is my data is is my chart not up to date?
that is the August 11th candle. No, my chart is accurate. Uh, I use gold futures. Gold futures is price discovery. Uh, that's, uh, for me, that is the price of gold. Um, if you can find spot gold at 1915, I mean, great. Uh, if you can buy, I don't know, 10,000 ounces, you can then resell it at 1925, uh, make 10 grand. Oh, it's ETH, just calling it meth. A drug, yeah, that's true. Makes sense. This is Apple. Apple rallied a little bit on Friday, huh? Not much. Still looks like a disaster. Oh, look at that. <clears throat> Apple on an MRI Monday. Guys, a lot of stocks might be hitting MRI, MRI buys on Monday. Along with the whole stock market, Monday could be a nice bounce. May not be the ultimate bounce. Let me look at some stocks. Let's look at Amazon. No, Amazon is not on an MRI buy, but earnings were in the way, right? So earnings moved a lot of stuff. Netflix, no. Roku, Roku could be on an MRI buy coming up. It's not? Huh, interesting. Uh, yeah, Roku will need a few more days. Yeah, Roku will have an MRI buying in a couple of days. Tesla. Tesla is on an MRI buy on Friday. Chinese Tesla. Facebook. Facebook has a little further to go. I think the markets are going to be rebuilt. Look at that. Monthly. Oh, Facebook is going to top on a monthly scale. What about AMD? Next week could be a little bit of a rally in the markets. Next week, we can have a little bit of a rally in the markets. But we're also hitting monthly MRI tops. Like So there's a, you know, it's, it's a weird time for the stock market right now. Tilray, wow, Tilray rallied, huh? Look at Tilray, Tilray rally. Speaking of drugs, look at that. We miss it? Good earnings. Well, bad earnings, but good move on earnings. They surprised on revenue. Wow. Impressive. What about JMIA? I've been waiting for this one. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh, it hit an MRI top. It hit an MRI top. It was doing well. I threw this bullish trade out a while ago, but it hit an MRI top and then it went even higher. So there was definitely the ability to profit take. How much did it go up off my line? We were up 30%. That's nothing to sneeze at. And there was an MRI top. So I always take profit on an MRI top. And the rest would have been stop loss. Uh, yeah, I need to take this trade off, right? They got it still in the green, even on Friday close. Obviously, this would have been a break-even stop loss. You guys know the tone base rules. Never let profitable trades go to go bad. I forgot all about this. I must have done it a while ago. No, or last week, maybe. Uh, yeah, beautiful breakout. We went into an MRI top. That's a doji candle. You get out. If you didn't get out, you would have been, you have to get out on this hammer candle. So lots of chances to take profit. Definitely should have been a profitable trade. And earnings is coming up. No one should be holding this into earnings. It was a weekly scale. Sorry, this isn't a daily scale. It's a weekly scale. Was there a daily MRI top within these two weeks? So last, the final week of July and the first week of August. Let's see if there was a daily MRI top here somewhere. There wasn't, but there was this candle. So I am very bullish on this candle here. So... That's a weekly MRI top, and then you have a daily star. So I'm very bullish, and it closed very bullish. It's the following day. Uh, I'm still bullish. This is the day where I become less bullish. So on August 2nd is the day that I get concerned. This is called an expanded range candle, and I would usually set my stop loss on 
slightly below the center of that candle. This is what I teach in my video. So if you take the range of this candle, you figure out where the middle is and you put your stop loss a smidge below the middle, anywhere, like somewhere between 25% up the candle and 49% up the candle. So I would have put it somewhere around here and somewhere in the middle of August 2nd, I would have exited that trade. Uh, this is, again, if you want to know how, uh, I'm not just talking shit. Uh, this is all in a video. It's all in this video, on-demand videos. It is all thoroughly explained in risk and position management. And I do recommend buying them together for 500 bucks. You get to save $200 uh, if you buy analysis and risk management for 500. I explain it all there, how to take proper stop losses. All right, let's look at those interest rates. Can I check the queues? Uh, yeah, we can check the queues. I mean, the queues is just NASDAQ. I prefer to check the NASDAQ. The queue is just a reflection of the NASDAQ. It looks bad. It's coming up on a monthly MRI top. That is something of a concern. There is a monthly MRI warning candle, and next month is going to be a monthly MRI top. You can see how we rallied beautifully off the monthly MRI buy, and now we're coming up on a monthly MRI sell. Would have been nice for us to go a little bit higher. I love this double top ish situation. And uh, look how the NASDAQ almost caught up. And I think we're going to break out and we go higher. How low can NASDAQ go? Well, it can go into the, the moving averages, right? And then you go up, back to make a triple top. And then break up. So something like that, maybe. Make a nice ascending triangle. Let's look at the rate. Here's our 10-year yield. That's a monthly scale. Let's go weekly. What a beautiful, again, double top. Same thing with the NASDAQ. So the yield is currently sitting. The last time the yield was this high was back in 2008. Wow. Wow, the U.S. government's so screwed. The U.S. government is so screwed. I think this is going higher. I think the yield is going to go higher. I think it's going to go into 55 to 6% on a 10-year bond. Uh, the... no, one, no one should own these things. I mean, sure, you want to earn 5%, but uh, I, I would love for this to go way higher. I would love for the 10-year yield to go 7%. Let's rip the Band-Aid. Let's have uh, the United States uh, default under debt. I got to redo this chart here. I thought I had a nicer one going. Is this the one I was working on? It was. Budget, wages, transportation. I thought I had a different one, man. Or was it this one? No, I think it was this one. What the hell is that? Savings. I got to get my, oh yeah, this was different. Income tax. Oh, I don't think, there we go. Something's off here. Oh, okay. I have budget versus spending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I have. Okay. I, I can mess with this. Yeah. I, mean, I just got to bring everything else down. Yeah, because I have my own stuff here. So this is last year's numbers. And then I'll need this year's numbers.
And as you see, budget and spending, the deficit is going nuts. This is last year's numbers. I need to update this. Yeah, the U.S. is totally screwed. I can't wait for the next month's numbers to come out. Ten-year yields going higher. That means uh, TLT will probably drop in price. Oh, family members arrived. I already see cars. A quick peek at currencies. Yeah, TLT is going lower. L look at this break of this line right here. Man, it's, it's kind of hard to believe that TLT is going to go even lower. But <clears throat> again, you can draw a beautiful support line. It just broke. Moving averages look terrible. Double bottom's coming. And then the bottom can break. Can, can, this can break down further. I mean, look how much this has fallen already. Bond investors are a disaster. I'm not even going to cherry pick the top. I'm going to go off the double top. This thing is down 45%. 45%. Jesus. That's bad. Joe is short 10 year future. Good for Joe. Good for you, Joe. Five and a half to six. Yep, I'm thinking the same. I'm thinking the same. It will be really bad for the US government. How high can Bitcoin in this bull cycle, in your opinion? Uh, you know, I think Bitcoin is going to struggle a lot. What's my real name in Russian? It's not Anton. Anton is Anton. Everyone thinks my Russian name is Anton, and it's not. If my Russian name was Anton, my English name would be Anton. In Russian, it's Anton. In English, it's Anton. And in European, in, in European name is Anton. Just the accents. There. So real quick, I want to glance at the Russian currency is still devaluing. And uh, the Brazil, Brazilian economy is doing great. Mexican economy is doing great. Uh, Indian rupee oh i'm concerned about the indian rupee uh turkey i'm not even concerned about it's just oh it slowed down uh the russian ruble is a bit of a disaster right now which is interesting and uh, it just shows you that ukraine is doing fairly well in their counteroffensive, relatively speaking All right. Oh, most, most important thing, tequila spreadsheet. Hey, guys, there is a link to this in the video description. I finally, you know, spell check this to the point where it's not embarrassing because I can't write, read or write. And I know most people are not going to, like, have this thing saved. So I made a picture for you. Uh, so there's an image. You can, if you are in the spreadsheet, you should be able to just. Uh... What the hell did I do? Control Z. Screw up again. Hold on. Power. Boom. Okay. Uh, so there's the image. So uh, screenshot the image. How can I do that? Oh, okay. I know what I can do. If I open this, I can do this. Ah, I just took out the spreadsheet. Crap. Control Z. Ah, go back. There we go. That's the spreadsheet. I have to open it as a new tab. There you go. So you can screenshot this. And next time you're at the store, you open up the picture. Now, this isn't all of it. Like the, the, the tequila spreadsheet has like 100 tequilas. And uh, I would have loved to put like a lot more over here in the. Extra Añejo, special gift category. Uh, this bad boy here is 500 bucks. I've never had it. Uh, this one has become my new favorite. I, I saw it at a store in New Jersey for 250 bucks. I may pick it up. And I actually saw this one in the wild. I was visiting a friend and I saw this bottle and I couldn't help it. I had to buy it. This was uh, also just under 300 but I've never seen it before in my life, and I don't think I ever will. And it was the eight-year version. It's an eight-year age. Uh, these I've never had. I've had the El Tesoro. Um, 
other Extron Yeho. This is their longer aged Extron Yeho. They have one that's aged four years. This one is aged five years. And uh, the Extron Yeho tab is right here. So I grabbed a few of these. I have a G4 Extron Yeho. I have a bunch of them down in Panama. I can get them for like $70, which is incredible. Uh, but not the five year version, just a four year version. They have a four year, four and a half year, and uh, a five year uh, of the G4. Uh, my bar in Panama is stacked with G4s because we there's a distributor of G4 there. It's uh, it's funny. I've never seen this bottle ever in America, not a single store. I've never been to an American uh, store, liquor store, to see G4. But in Panama, I see it. Meanwhile, none of the others in my A plus zone uh, exist in Panama. So it's really, really crazy, right? Like, I, not a single A plus is in Panama, but G4 is. So that's it. So on, the, on this side, this is the overall. Um, everything, a, anything in the A category in Panama, I can't find. Only the G4, which is great because it's in my A plus zone. So it's perfect. As long as I find one of these somewhere, and then I walk into a store here in New Jersey, uh, they have good stuff. They have like maybe six tequilas from my Azo. They have, um, I still haven't seen Fortaleza. I saw it all over Japan. Like in Japan, I saw Fortaleza, Fortaleza everywhere. Not in America. Never, never walked into a store. I've seen that. Uh, but the store here in, uh, in New Jersey, um, not far from Pennsylvania, uh, they have Sieta Legas, they have El Oldi El Tesoros, they have some of the Tequila Ochos, uh, they have Pasote, one of them just a the silver, unfortunately. Um, hey, heads up on a live stream. You're not on camera. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, and the El Tequilino. Oh, I've been drinking El Tequilino. That one's good. So this one store has like six of them and they have a bunch of the expensive stuff. They have the, uh, they have both of the fancy Altosoros. They have tears of Lorena. They only had one bottle. It was 250 bucks. I wonder if it's still there. Um, yeah. But what people are surprised about is this. So class Azul is in my D area. You know, things like 1800, uh, you know, don't ever buy Michael Jordan's tequila or Kendall Jenner's. Uh, Michael Jordan is in the F category. That's just terrible. Uh, Jose Cuervo and Hornitos, they're not even tequilas. Uh, it's like ethanol. They're not even using agave. Like it, uh, anyway, uh, uh, read these links, check it out. Am I afraid of a dox? There's not much to dox, guys. Any wine guide? Maybe. We're working on a tequila guide. Uh, sorry, whiskey guide. That one's going to take like another. I'm not doing it myself. I'm not a whiskey guide. But I'm going to have friends do a similar guide. Uh, wine is hard. I need to take a sommelier course first. I have my favorite wines, but I could be an idiot there. Anything? Well, I have a whole tab of celebrity brands, you know. Um, Codigo is actually a good tequila. Uh, I mean, no one's ever heard of George Strait, so it's hard to say whether it's a celebrity or not. Because uh, no, I, I I still have no idea who that is. Uh, so Codigo is listed as a celebrity tequila. It's actually good. Uh, it has no additives. Uh, it is properly made, but it's expensive. But it's a good tequila. And then there's a couple of more that are decent, uh, but everything else is just pure garbage. Tone, where can I find this? In the video description. You open the video description and there's a link and you can see all of this. Okay. So, but what I recommend is you take a screenshot of this picture. Take a screenshot of this picture. I put maybe 25 tequilas here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, more than that. There's seven here. One, two, three, four, five, six here. That's about 15 plus 15. That's about 30. Uh, you got about 40, 40 good options right here. 
Um, most of my B plus and up is covered right in this single picture, right? And I even broke it down by uh, like money and stuff, like by price. So uh, for example, um, Arete is the best, cheap tequila. But for example, this Cimarron, uh, it's probably $20. At best, it's 20 bucks. And you're better off drinking this than $150 Class Azul. Like it, it'll be better <laughs> than $150 uh, Class Azul or Pizarro. So basically, if there was a Cimarron, it's probably the cheapest thing here. Uh, Mi Campo is also uh, pretty cheap, but like Cimarron right here, this one. Um, $20 bottle, maybe. And if this was on a shelf, like this was 20 And then, you know, the popular Classe Azul. Classe Azul Reposado. This guy. I, I'm, I'm drinking Cimarron. For 20 bucks. This bottle is, I've seen it over $200. But that's because uh, it's not even aged well. Like you can go to the Añejo tab, sorry, uh, Reposado tab. Um, you can find Cimarron, should be in my B or B plus area, should be in the B plus area. Maybe even A minus. Cimarron right there, A minus. Uh, it is a, no, it can't be 35 bucks. That's way too expensive. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I've seen this thing super cheap. Yeah, $30. Look at that. $30. Okay. Or about like a Mi Campo. I'm going to go for the Reposado. 26. All right. Um, so there you go. See, my one's good. So $30 tequila versus a, which is a $200 tequila. And see, my one's better. And again, if you go to the tab, right? All right, come on. Need more memory. Let me refresh. All right, still on a live stream. All right, everyone sitting down for breakfast. I don't even eat breakfast, but I'm going to go sit down. Uh, so real quick, so here, if you go to uh, Classe Azul, Classe Azul Reposado. That's the that's Casa Dragones. Where is Classe Azul? I have to have it here somewhere. Wow, I really don't see it. It's got to be here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Classe Azul Repo. It's aged eight months, which is not bad. Uh, you have the gold version, which is 400. That's just completely insane. And uh, versus the Cimarron. It's only aged four months. Eh. Again, but it's a cheap tequila, right? I have it at 35. I think you can get it way cheaper than that. So you can get, you know, good cheap options. What you need to stay away from is anything that says diffuser. See, diffuser, acid thermal. This is basically uh, using acid to create your tequila. It's the, you know, the, the, the same reason why Casa Dragonas is great. Here's the problem. There's Casa Dragones. It's great, except it uses acid to create the tequila. So if there's one thing I can help people with is to try, stop drinking uh, tequila that's made with acid, no matter how great it tastes. Okay? Uh, so you don't want a tequila that's made with a diffuser. And uh, some tequilas are made with a diffuser, but then they... Uh, so there... So here's the process of making tequila, right? 
there is the extraction process and then there is the cooking process. And there is a really good video that describes it all right here. Um, I have it up in the front as well. So if you go to all brands, uh, right here, I have a couple of must watch videos. Here's your favorite tequila made with a diffuser. So if you click on that, uh, he talks about the difference. Uh, do you, and it's part of like a tequila playlist. I'm going to make one of these for whiskey as well. So do they make the tequila in the oven? Do they make it with an autoclave or do they make it with a diffuser? So here is what an oven looks like. This is what an autoclave looks like. And here is what a diffuser looks like. So if we play this video real quick, just a small part of it, I'm going to speed it up a smidge. Starches found in the blue agave planet of Dirkles. So that means the summit. And with old school traditional brick oven, the process of steam cooking can take a long time, usually around 36 hours, and then another day or so longer for the agaves to cool down. Since time is money, this process is more expensive when compared to other faster cooking processes, such as the autoclave. These are giant steel tubes that can cook agaves under intense steam pressure in about eight hours. They can also cook more agaves at a, at a time. So this is a big saver of time and money. Many tequila distilleries today use autoclaves, but is there a faster way? Oh, you bet. This is a diffuser. We don't have specific details about how diffusers work because most tequila distilleries would rather not reveal that they use one at all and rarely allow people to tour their distillery. But we do know some things, so just for fun, we created this artist's rendition of the process. In short, there aren't very many people needed when you have a diffuser machine around to do all the work that the people used to do. The diffuser is a machine about the size of a basketball court, and it inverses the traditional tequila making process, all in the name of efficiency. So instead of cooking first and then separating the sugars from the fibers, a diffuser extracts the starches first using blasts of high pressure water that rip through the whole agaves as they pass through on a conveyor belt. The cooking process, or hydrolysis, happens later on. In some cases, there is no cooking at all. And the agaves are soaked in a bath of hydrochloric acid, which chemically converts the starches to sugars instead of using heat. This is the way that most agave nectars are made. And instead of using acid, some diffuser-made products use high-pressure vertical autoclaves that boil the starch-filled slurry coming out of the diffuser, which is what then converts the starches into sugars. Using a diffuser is the fastest and cheapest way to produce tequila. Most of the big tequila brands have switched to using this method because, well, it just looks really great on the bottom line. So what does all of this mean? Brands that use a diffuser will say that there is no difference in quality. Well, the only way to find out if that is true is by conducting a blind taste test. So let's review those results. We gave blind samples to 32 members of the Tequila Matchmaker Tasting Panel. This particular group of experienced tequila tasters were chosen for their ability to rate all types of tequila fairly. 78% were male, 22% were female. 75% were tequila aficionados, and the other 25% were bartenders. The lineup included six tequilas, all of them produced in the Tequila Valley region of Jalisco. Pura Sangre Blanco, Tres Generaciones Plata, Siembra Valles Blanco, Casa Dragones Blanco, Fortaleza Blanco, and Partida Blanco. Two of these are made using a brick oven, two of them are made with an autoclave, and two are made using a diffuser. The overall averages were as follows. Using a 100-point rating scale, Fortaleza Blanco rated highest with an 88.88 .88 average. Siembra Valles Blanco followed closely behind with an 86.56 average score. Partida Blanco was third with an 85.81. Pura Sangre Blanco received an 84.22 average score. All of these tequilas fell within the range of good. The next two fell in the range of fair. Casa Dragones Blanco earned a score of 79.44, and Tres Generaciones Plata came in with the lowest score of 78.9. Right, so you can see it right there. Uh -huh. So uh, this is why when you go back to the spreadsheet, you will always see, uh, like, like I describe it right there, the extraction process using a Tahoma versus a mill versus a diffuser, and then using an oven versus an autoclave versus acid. And uh, so you will see near the top, if I go to say the Añejo tab, the closer, the more you are at the top, you will see a lot more ovens 
a lot more tahona, which is very rare. And then uh, once you, uh, like, you're not going to go very far down and then tahona kind of starts to go away. Uh, oven starts to go away. Autoclave comes in more. And then eventually the diffuser shows up. Uh, now, this is an insanity right here. 818 by Kylie Jenner. So it's made properly with a tahona and an oven, but they put so many additives that the tequila is just tastes like pure sugar. So this is like weird, but uh, that's basically the concept. So while Casa Dragones is a tequila that's worth hundreds of dollars, I will not touch it personally. All right. All right, guys. Thank you all for watching. I need to get to breakfast. And um, like I said, over here, I added a picture to make things easier. It's not everything, but at least it will be easier for you to shop when you walk into a store and you want a proper tequila. All right, guys. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all on the next one. Prior to me doing this and making this list, my favorite was uh, Heradura Selection Suprema. But that has now dropped down the list. Still have it in the A area, but... Uh, I want to try all of these one day before I get there. <laughs> so uh, when I'm at a shop and I feel like spending 200 bucks, uh, it'll no longer be on the Selection Suprema. It'll now be on something from up there. All right. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all on the next one. And uh, enjoy. Bye, guys.